So what uh, I've done here is uh, I've done a case study on uh, established uh, listed retail company uh, for the circular economy model and is very successful doing that. Uh, so this is a company called Delica Atmosphere. And what it does is that it converts PED into what's called RTL. And the impact that it has is that typically when we get pet bottles, the bottom line is usually one year. And when converting this material into uh, uh, PSM, what happens is that this is actually used in things like clothes, blankets, pillows, towels, etc. And that basically means that the temperature is uh, so, the pet industry and typically uh, the uh, main pet product, which is not the recycle, and there's a lot of demand that's going because in India, what you have is very fast going FMCG packaging industry, etc. And that's essentially what is driving a lot of the demand for, uh, for uh, pet. Uh, so, if you look at the pet recycling, uh, these are some of the triggers that are positive. Obviously, a lot of growing environmental awareness, which means that a lot of demand for recycled pet. Uh, there's a lot of organization and consumption, which means that there's a lot of availability of the raw materials, which is the pet bottles, etc. Uh, in terms of technology, what you also find is that there are new technologies that are available to recyclers, like sorting, etc. And that's making it uh, easier uh, for companies. Uh, in terms of economic demand, there's, a, as we said, a lot of demand for pet packaging uh, that is there. Uh, lots of environmental regulations, obviously, because of that the plastic bottles tend to destroy uh, emotions, etc. And uh, the scarcity of virgin pet, and because virgin pet is scarce, uh, there are, uh, you know, other things that. Uh, uh, and a lot of government support that stuff. Awesome. Uh, the other thing that I think will happen is uh, what's called DPR regulations, where uh, people, uh, companies that are uh, using or uh, producing plastic products, they have to keep on entering of their products. And obviously, there are a lot of ethical considerations in terms of power responsibility, etc. So this is, a, this is how the property functions in terms of its value state. So it sources the best that on a variety of sources uh, in India and across with scrap dealers, waste management properties, consumers, etc. And uh, so it has a very strong network. And uh, then it uses a uh, very uh, state of the art facility in terms of inside. And then you have the outbound logistics. Uh, most of the savings. Is in India, but it also exports to about 20 countries. Uh, that's what it does. And then uh, you know, strong marketing and sales, a lot of uh, tech support, etc. Okay. Uh, so, this is the product portfolio in terms of the end use. So, these are some of the end uh, use products, the fabric studies, the materials, etc. And these are the two forms, Arpet Fiber and Arpet Sanya. Uh, so, if you look at uh, the uh, the pet is basically the recycled pet is sold in both forms. Flakes, bottle, plates, or chips, uh, or bottle plates, uh, chips, extra plate, and recycled pipes. So, when you look at how these are basically used, so these are used as well in terms of these different types of variants. Some, uh, say, bottles are basically used in the bottle and food products. Uh, the textile rates are very acceptable. When you look at what analysis of the company, uh, what it has on the list of branding and reputation, uh, obviously, there are a lot of opportunities that we've already discussed. Uh, the weaknesses are that there's a surprise of poor raw materials, so things like currency exchange rate, aluminum, etc., could create a problem for them. 
limited geographic reach because a lot of these businesses were uh, not much in terms of its background. And uh, the bread is obviously a fact that uh, there's a lot of competition from other recycling companies. There will be changes in terms of uh, preference. Okay. Uh, so it's a very balanced company in terms of its strategy. So, uh, so these are some of the pressures that they face. So, uh, product pressure, and one of the ways that we saw this is that we diversified the product portfolio in terms of uh, the number of customers. Uh, raw material pressures are trying to make sure that a lot of control in terms of the raw material that is to uh, the power of the distribution network. Cost pressure, again, what the price is focused on is make sure that the food port and water lines are all extremely improving. And so, the competition work that I do is that they create entry barriers to other companies in terms of the product of the product of the brand, etc. And also, the quality is actually passed to here, and they will be actually be able to collect the price payment for their products. So, uh, uh, yeah. So this is the environmental. Uh, so when you look at this ESP impact, this is basically what it looks like. So over the last decade, we have uh, saved almost seven million people yards of landfill space as a result of the activities. Uh, and in terms of uh, CO2 savings, it's up to 1.4 billion tons that have been saved over the period of 10 years and the other things. Uh, in terms of that environment, social impact, what we find is that a lot of the activities are actually involved women and parents. A lot of these, the, the operations are actually run by women. So there's a huge social impact. Uh, there's a lot of CSR initiatives that they go through or uh, that they want to take in, which is also uh, has a very positive effect. Uh, they also uh, place a lot of focus on corporate governance. And so they have, for instance, in their annual reports, they have very detailed government support, and uh, they also have a number of government committees. So, for instance, they have a corporate social responsibility committee, they have audit committee, etc. So, there's a lot of focus that is also based on corporate governments. Okay. And uh, so, uh, one of the things which is very striking is this company is not only has an ESG impact, but it is also very successful in terms of financial. So you find that uh, over a period of the of five years, it's actually projected to double its uh, revenue and also doubling its profit after that. So it's actually been a very, very successful firm in terms of its uh, of profits. And when you look at uh, the value creation for its shareholders, you'll find that again, it's been a very, very successful firm. And so if you look at the last five years, uh, you, know, you lose the BAC Sensex as a benchmark. In the last five years, the BAC benchmark uh, Sensex has only grown by 80%. But when you look at the company share price, it's actually grown close to 300%. So, uh, so this is a great example of a company which uh, you know, uh, has been successful for because it's combined a lot of things. One is that it has combined and it has identified a market for an industry which is very large, which is high growth. The second is that it has identified a business model which is uh, yeah, which is very robust. And uh, uh, and along with that, they really had a very strong focus in terms of the ESG impact. And at the same time, if you look at the strategic management, again, very, very focused in terms of figuring out uh, what are the things to do to make sure that uh, the company is successful. Right. So, uh, so summarize, you know, can be very effective in the ESG space using the circular economy model, and you can also be very money for that. So, uh, what is the the on the activities of the uh, I like to look at that we take on the public opportunity for presenting this business plan. So I am here and I am here to be able to talk to the users. So currently I am doing two years of the operators 
format in the box. And I don't use the word in the box. So let's just change that. We are going to do this for a second. Let me use that for this. So here I am setting for a file of my image results and the image results. Part of the results. So as I said, it will be the part of the image in the script is for the sense. This is the feeling that is copied by the process of work for this. But it has its little tips on how they are different between objects and sense. So that is why I am saying I'm going to do it. So my next question is how is this picture? I don't know how this underwear edges in this place that I mentioned. So I am more focusing on the solid editions. I will have all the time that this would be the system. And I will really talk about that a lot, and I'll discuss about this uh, general discussion about files, and some of the points in the details are on this case. So, in case of Nepal, uh, this is the standard energy data service technologies. So, data and the technology that uh, we are working with the project side. This is basically on this global stock. So, we call this uh, small experience uh, biodiversity, and we call this portable uh, biodiversity. In the institution and the community level, so we have this one of this modified system. But uh, my research is related to the small level of any institution and the other, there is a So we have this two different kind of technologies, which is called this PSPS system and also this NIDS system. These are the kind of people that we are working in this world. So we have a picture of this uh vision boards. So this is the world that we have the work by uh options that we want to be studio you know, works that as well. This one. And we have other technologies that we have to be in the process. So we can also this uh implementation modality. So we are actually following this public private partnership. So on this three different parts. The domestic buyers and power to the other is so we are working on the two modalities, but the two modalities are different between the two different parts. And in terms of this domestic buyers, that's what private companies go to the three hands in the city. They are not just the same in this industry, they are not the industry to one. That we can see and they can be mastered by the installed system and then it can come down with the software. In the commerce area, so we call it a little bit more different in two worlds. We call it design, grid, finance, software, and so on. And that is also the student. And the main thing about the student, the speed model is a design, grid, finance, open, and fast. So as we know, there are different kinds of these people in the world. So we have a very limited design to be in these three parts. So we can also please provide this support. In my opinion, also part of our CPS is the body of So, we're providing some kind of services and subsidies. So, for the community, what has been the The support is about 40% of this kind of cost. You know, when you provide the is 60% private sector activities. So, that's why we need to understand what other kind of is. Because then this is the private sector and public sector possibly to kind of produce. So this is something that's been based upon this is uh, highly different process. So one category is to make technical distribution materials. Another category is to So this one of the children I suggest the standard from the table for per day to 50,000 per day. And this is very basic for every vegetable. So this may be useful or also for all of these things called the yes, selling of this yes, fertilizer and the seed. So the key objects of this research is to identify these investment risks from the public private side. The quality may apply that is the type of business. Let's talk about this uh this notice. It's a service of policy of the public. So the methodology of this research may be just to that of this phenomenal uh, higher education, it's called ART methodology, which is a popular character uh, decision tool, especially in the, the, the decision making sessions. So, and we also refer to smart client service software, which is a character decision software, uh, the government is a risk, and quite a kind of this. 
And uh, we know that this is a topic of the term. And we know that it is a party participants of the public and people who have been speaking on the group. They are the people, the most of them are from the government and the development partners. And the third private sector for the investors of the systems. So we, we just want to know what are the different risks they possess, and we will basically quantify this and, and, and what are the that they So for this, we prepare this risk graphics, and for this, we also prepare this risk graphics. So we have uh, identified these four different kinds of risks one is the technical and technology, technical policy and initiative, or the environmental sector, and fourth is the financial market. Among these four major risk categories, there are different 18 sub risk categories. And we need to, from uh, the survey, we need to basically rank this kind of the risk first. And then we need to quantify the risk based on the two different projects for the municipal and the regular social energy. And uh, what is real success here in the top structure? So the findings of this work, especially from the public sector, I'm just presenting the public sector here. The public sector will have among four different risks. Financial and market is with the critical risk that is implemented uh, in this kind of the projects. So, after financial and market risk, the second is the policy and industry risk, and other other risks are which are kind of this weightage for the risk. And uh, we also saw the difference what is the difference between these risks in the public sector and private sector. Because the risk consumption is basically dependent on the sector to sector. So, from the public and private, both areas possible financial market is uh, the better risk. But there is a difference in the quality and industry and the technical and technology. Private sector is getting more things about the policy, the technical and technological risk. But the public sector is basically considered the policy and industry is the better risk. And among these other things, this sort we quantify this uh, different sub risks. And this we found three are the critical sub critical risks. For the revenue risk, for the gas, electricity, and fertilizer risk. If they don't uh, able to sell this, uh, this cover, they will scale it in the loss. And second is the operational risk because they have to, they need kind of this uh, uh, raw material availability and, and the soil. Supply chain, so this is another critical risk that, that, that we found. And third one is the private sector investment and this capex utilities, which are the three critical risks. So we can see these the local weights and global weights. So these are the quantified figures of this risk. So I'm not going into detail, so these are the three critical risks. So we also analyze on these, these two kinds of risk projects with uh, uh, this uh, agro industry and this uh, and this building uh, fund. So we just evaluate based on this subject. So where this we can find we see this the sporting sector and the private sector. The echo industry was there are found this yes, yes, it is the most present. The same sort of figure. We know there are lots of obligations in this industry in the agriculture sector than the than the agriculture. Yeah. So these are some of the policy indicators that we have found that we found, especially this uh the I also they are reversal, it's a market uh, the market and the reason is the reason is. And we need some kind of this uh, think the different models on this uh, different previous industry and models of this. So these are kind of some of the policy pictures for that. So this is all about time. Then this is so if you have any questions and any issues, that the great week time we have to close. Dealing with waste, what to do that? Waste is basically a the kind of resource that uh, I think some of the uh, speakers in reforming itself, in the presence of such matter, is a resource in the place. This kilogram of waste from macro is equivalent to one kilogram of LPG in the form of energy. So it is not actually waste. If we are able to utilize it, yes, we can engage it. Oh. So there are several uh, sorts of this work. And when we talk about rural global south, so in rural India, it is uh, four types. One is cooking, using traditional cooking stove, 
सेकंड इज स्टबल बर्निंग थर्ड इज जेगरी प्लांट और जेगरी कंडीशन ऑफ इंडस्ट्रियल और कॉटेज इंडस्ट्री फोर्थ इज द ब्रिक यू मेक द ब्रिक अब सोइल ओवरलिंग using the uh, mud or and then you uh, heat it up whatever it is here i'm not going this is for you to do yeah there we have been the victim of air pollution for the last seven years it's not good all the people get but to speak the static of mid of our product When we start when we start in the state of Punjab, our Punjab and Nepal Punjab, so in the Punjab is Nepal, in the Punjab is Nepal, and then the entire world in the Punjab because we generally go from west to south, east to west, according to the model of India. There is no very clear the wind blowing from north to south to south, and that why entire world. And then there is and there is also urban pollution in the form of transport. The bigger pollution in there, there. So it starts and now it starts over there, and it is difficult to break in there. People are in the house, and it is hot view all every time. You can see, it. yeah, the PM two point five. Final ultra fine particulate matter in India is around 5.2 million tons, out of which around 48% is from biomass, including pollution. 13% and 6.5% from the raw burning, and 29 times around from industry, including both. All the generators and industry, textile and so on, even power plant. Yeah, power plant is like point five. Transport is around seven, and the rest is from here. So why I said it's not free rural global south because if you take these together and part is some transport uh, industry, it is almost sixty percent. So we keep the rules here and this is the PM. There is CO2. You have to equal it out. We can have well as other gases. Sector-wise, energy is the biggest sector for emission in the country globally, and is costing around seventy-five percent of. So we will end up with some. Let's come to G H G. Go on. And because of shortage of time, yes. These are the four uh, three uh, programs which are just going to. This is this kind of one. We give them the chart. This is the chart part. These are the two three that this is the four of the four part of it. And this is the four scenario of the chart. The seven burning, the cooking, jelly, and the these are four sectors in India. And similar sectors in African countries, cooking, the seven burning, char or formula for cooking, and then again the cooking as well. So cooking using charcoal, which will be major thing, so it will be thrown in there, and that will be the category in our world of that. But they are also using traditional trees for. Out of this, burning and pollutants and pollutants from and some of them are also in this process. While the lack of particular effect to have direct and this is the need and need pass direct impacted humans is to understand which is the bad subject which are the more negative the problem where are it is not there. So this is the global setup of 
This is the data for the user global answer, and we are part of the global users. Although it has no part of the global and perhaps the bonus of per capita, it has the least per capita, but our conclusion is too much because we have a point for video to use. Otherwise, the place of Canada and US, the inverters are the this is the cook stove which I have seen in the Uganda after the three months of the month 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 of the this becomes the easy diagonal behavior. Yes, so my point is that if you don't burn the stubble, if you convert it into pellet, pellet can be placed at three, then no more, and three because it's starting to go here, or to be at a bit of 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 This is the which we have developed in IIT Delhi. And at least I think we operate operated our main gas town before it's a lot of us now during COVID second week. When the team of J and R paper center was there, 15 people, and two kilograms of pellet was there to meet the requirement of 15 people cooking almost everything, including chapati oil, to be can cook everything. And you can see it bulk similar to and we there is no smoke. Otherwise, the guest house stuff will ask to go out. Why not polluting on the kitchen? There's no smoke at all. Next. Next slide. Yeah, this is the video I have taken from the uh for the household ladies cooking, and you can see the, the potential of. Ajada in the form of content as well as if this fire somehow reaches to this place, the entire house will burn into place. So it is dangerous. Also. Right. Yeah. So you can see the two the focus stove and the IG focus stove. And we are in the form of emission, we are around uh, one eleventh in the form of emission of CO. So we are reducing the CO2 emission 11 times lower than the LPG store and particular micro fine and water fine particular matter as one part of LPG. And we are further uh, achieving maybe better with the testing is going on. So what we thought we thought to have it into the field. Another issue we are Taking up the jerry plant, which we are going to discuss later. So please don't leave it. This is the stubble burning in Punjab. This is the jerry plant. You can see the quantum of smoke coming out. It is damaging the entire ecosystem. The 
particular tobacco is equally harming the human being as well as the plants. It will stop, or you can say, the, the passage where the photosynthesis takes place due to the forest that will grow up and it will damage the health. And if I can see in the city, if there is no rain for maybe let us say four or five months, the leaves of any tree become black and you know and have empty by them. During rainy season they become rainy. No, they are they, they shine. They become healthier because the pollutants have been washed out. And photosynthesis taking place properly. Next. Next slide, please. Yeah. So by the three activities, only three activities I have calculated, and we can reduce the CO2 emission of the country by around 20%, particulate matter by around 60%. By CO2. So that is what happens. And that's why I mean equally applicable in the entire global carbon. So if we are in position to reduce around 20% of emission of every country. And 60% of the emission, so the air will be neither clean. So the global, entire global power will be free from the soil. That is what I wanted to convey to you. What we can do? Can we please just repeat it? So we can collect the uh, biomass using the liner. Actually, the problem of this level comes from harvest. Well, in the mechanical harvesting, we can also get start from work. So harvesting they cut down the uh, the crop of the half. The half they will so if they run the liner, it will line it out, and if they run the uh, bail. So, so this will bail it out, and bail can be transferred. It can be Stored from the other, and it can be flagged or waiting for mixing with other biomass at time, which is good in properties, good for burning, and good for releasing least possible stuff. Next. Yeah, the last one. Yes, just let me just let us say how to make facts. Which is just a medium of the job. You can slide me what asked me because it's natural. Yeah. So, yeah, this is the video which will project between Provence University and Delhi and Shana University, funded by British Council. Then those like the pastor. So, these are the uh, project partners. And we made everything we had. To understand whether the person who is using in the field will be able to cook. So, if you are able to cook, then you have already been speaking in the other So, we have done everything. We cooked almost every food over there and you cannot find any small. Then, we have trained the people in the field. We have distributed the cookie store to them and we are also checking their health, the status of their health before we are disseminated and after three months we are also going to take the data and then we have to quantify how much health benefit are there to people when they are cooking on the food services. We are from small and the food services and And we are also taking the data and the using the uh, sampler, a particular map we are using. And we found that with the background pollution, it is Difficult to uh, quantify, but when we are using IIT to model, almost three times the PM uh, emission or PM evolution has reduced, so it's going to give the health benefit. So these are the team members. Three of them are here, including myself. Yeah. Thanks, please, quickly, so that she wants to show me the other guitar. These are other benefits which we can do. Yeah, so these are the context that we project on the And next, these are the interns who are part of the project, and these are the project So far, and this is the sum of the 
Right. And thank you so much. I would like to start off by introducing the topic Recycling and Utilization of Waste uh, Printed Circuit Boards. To begin with, uh, with the onset of the Industrial Revolution, the fourth Industrial Revolution, came in uh, the excessive use of electronics and electrical uh, devices. And of course, it had its benefits as well, but I, I would like to talk about the cons, to be precise. Uh, with the advent of this industrial revolution, we saw the use of PCBs, uh, cathode ray tubes, and so on. Over the period of time, the problem occurred in the fact that, um, as sorry, as time progressed, the uh, uh, generation of e-waste enhanced greatly. As uh, of 2020, reported is the fact that over 50 million tons of this e-waste has been generated so far. But the problem lies in the fact that only about 20% of this e-waste is recycled globally. And in a developing country like India, uh, we do not even have uh, proper facilities to recycle this e-waste. Maybe because of lack of knowledge, maybe lack of resources, we are yet to figure out. So today I'm here to just review a couple of methods that we use for recycling of e-waste in order to share uh, uh, the various methods and to educate the youth. So some of the various uh, components of e-waste include PCBs, cathode ray tubes, computers, and various other electronic gadgets. Uh, an electronic gadget becomes an e-waste when it basically loses its uh, functional ability and goes more towards the expiry date. So what do we do with these wastes? We usually end up throwing them in the corner of a house or an organization or an office. Most of the time, such is the case. And because of this buildup of the PCB waste or electronic waste, to be precise, we we don't really know what to do with such waste. Um, let us talk about some of the components that make up the PCBs. These include metals, non-metals, and hazardous materials. Now, because of the amount of PCB waste that has been generated, the amount of metals that are present there, if we talk about single components put together, the amount of metals that are present there are quite high. If these metals can be extracted from the PCBs instead of the traditional methods of mining, this could you know, uh, be quite beneficial. Reason being, extraction of these metals from PCBs is quite simple. It doesn't require too much energy as compared to the traditional mining methods. And such, such a method is known as urban mining, which falls directly under the concept of circular economy. We next move on to what are the possible ways in which e-waste is uh, uh, thrown away. The one factor is that it, uh, uh, after the use of uh, uh, e-waste or PCBs, uh, they are either thrown, uh, they are illegally dumped in various countries. They are also, the, it, it has also been seen that PCBs are incinerated. Now the problem is that PCBs are, I mean, they contain a lot of hazardous materials. When incinerated, these materials, they create vapors like brominated dioxins and toxic vapors. Now, of course, this again leads to air pollution. So that is not at all a plausible method to discard e-waste. And illegal dumping as well is creating uh, landfills and that is to be avoided as well. So. Coming to the various recycling methods that are available and can be used here as well are the physical and chemical methods. I'll quickly go over the physical and chemical methods. There's gravity separation, corona discharge and electrostatic separation, and magnetic separation in physical methods. And on the chemical, there's bioleaching, supercritical fluid, and vacuum pyrolysis. The physical methods under the first bit is the gravity separation method. This method is purely based on the density and size of the various particles that make up PCBs. Before the use of the physical methods, the PCBs are basically uh, accelerated towards a board and they are crushed in order to get fine particles. When these particles are 
uh, driven in high velocity uh, towards separation grooves based on their density the various materials fall down uh, in the uh, various uh, in the various grooves that are present now how does this happen every material uh, every particle that is present uh is basically subjected to two types of forces there's gravitational force as well as drag force the heavier particles the denser particles are subjected to a higher drag force in comparison with gravitational because of which they move fur further towards the separation towards the further separation grooves and fall down far away from the original distance whereas the low density particles they fall to uh, fall in the um, grooves which are present at the initial zone from where the particles are impinged so this is one of the various uh, one of the plausible methods that may be used to separate uh, heavy and lighter substances that make up the pcbs we then move on to the corona discharge and electrostatic separation method in this the fine particles which have already been found, uh, collected they are sent on a feeder which is vibrating in nature now this feeder basically dumps these uh, particles to a rolling electrode now or a rolling drum now during the course of time during their fall there's a corona electrode which discharges uh, uh, this thing and because of this discharge the metallic particles they basically roll out and fall to uh, the nearest possible uh, storage dump as can be seen in the figure with uh, the orange dots whereas the non metallic particles they get charged because of the corona electrode and they remain stuck to the rolling electrode and they keep rolling until they meet the brush and then they fall down to another separate storage bin which um, where all the non conductors are present somewhere in between of course there can be a mixture possible and this is where I mean, this is the place which shows the middling uh, storage bin altogether we talk about the third uh, physical method of separation which is magnetic separation in this uh the um, ma magnetic and non -ma magnetic materials can be separated however the non metallic fractions are also collected along with the ma ma magnetic fractions reason being uh subjection to strong magnetic fields so it's uh, it's very essential that we actually uh make sure that the magnetic field is not all that uh strong but at the same time it should also not be that weak so the balance between the two is quite necessary in order to obtain the right uh, mixture that we are looking for lastly we talk about the three chemical methods the first is the bio leaching process where it has been used to extract metals such as copper zinc and nickel in this case we basically try to replace the standard acid leaching process with a bio leaching process and in this we utilize a weak organic acid along with the use of microorganisms and the microorganisms some of them are namely azito uh, acidithiobacillus peroxid uh, peroxidines and acidithiobacillus thioxidines these along with the organic acids they act on the pcb boards and they leach out the uh, copper zinc and nickel uh, metals that are present in the pcb itself so the benefit of this process is basically that uh, th the disposal of organic acids is way easier as compared to the inorganic acids that were used earlier we also talk about the supercritical fluid method where we utilize a supercritical fluid such as carbon dioxide for example in one of the extractions where copper was being extracted supercritical carbon dioxide was used along with uh, uh, co-solvents like hydrogen peroxide and sulfuric acid the uh uniqueness of this particular uh, process is that the reaction time was greatly reduced the reaction time was reduced to 20 minutes instead of the standard 180 minutes that i uh, that was originally used for basic acid leaching lastly we talk about the vacuum pyrolysis method 
In this, the PCB is subjected to pyrolysis under very low pressure conditions, which is lower than the atmospheric. And with this process, we get two components, the organic matter and the inorganic matter. The organic matter is distilled away, whereas the inorganic is left behind. Now, of course, there are some pollutants that are created in this case, and these pollutants include uh, methane, bromine, and so on. However, these very pollutants can be used, uh, many, reused in the process itself, uh, either in the form of heat supply for the, the very process of pyrolysis, or they can be used as chemical feedstock. So, I think this is talking about about the organic matter. Sorry. Sorry. Ah, ma'am, we are done with the final part of the presentation. Okay, okay, okay. Sure, sure. All right. Um. Uh. Should Should I stop? If you want to conclude it, then then you stop. Okay, okay, fine, fine, fine. All right. So basically, the whole point of uh, this review was to uh, uh, talk about the various methods of uh, uh, this thing, uh, PCB recycling. And from that, the extracts that we get, non-metallic fractions as well as metallic, can be used in various uh, for various purposes. And yes, this is about it. Thank you so much. Okay, my name is Betali Hinkabra Medin. I am Urban Planner Designer. I'm a lecturer in Ambo University. My first topic will be identification, mapping, and assessment of hillside flood vulnerability in the case of Kajani Magata district in Addis Ababa. This thesis was conducted in 2020 while I was doing my master's thesis. So flood is one of the most devastating and natural disasters in the world. And it is known that it's going to be caused by natural and human-made effects. Uh, Addis Ababa is recently being exposed to uh, flood due to the increasing of precipitation and also urbanization effects. This makes Addis Ababa to be exposed to both riverine and flash flood. And due to high rate of urbanization in Addis Ababa, unplanned hillside development is increasing dramatically especially in the upper catchment of the Addis. And if there is, uh, it is known that unplanned and unmanaged uh, hillside development can lead a uh, flooding effect in the middle and lower catchment of the river. And of course, the upper catchment of the study area or like upper catchment of the stream will be also vulnerable and exposed to hillside flooding. And uh, one of the sites that are vulnerable to Hillside flooding is Magadda district. There are this found in the footprint of Ntoto Mountain, the upper catchment area. Their livelihood asset is seriously affected and damaged from the recurrent flooding. Uh, the main reason, like I want to identify factors that triggers flooding in the hillside area, is because in order to give a solution for any kind of things, we have to identify the real cause what trigger flood and also assess the degree of vulnerability and also identify what kind of impact that is created in their livelihood. So the specific objective focus on like to identify influencing factors that triggers, uh, triggers hillside flooding in the study area to map and describe degree of vulnerability uh, and impacts of livelihood on the community in the study area. So the partial scope. Uh, focus on the Gulali subsidy, Guarada 06, Makata district, and thematically it will focus on the cause and triggering factor of flood in the Hisai settlements and also flood vulnerability and its impact on the livelihood assets, uh, which focus on for the basic parameters, social, economical, physical, and environmental vulnerability. And also the impact will be assessed, direct or indirect uh, impact of flood. So the when you came to the research methodology, there isn't the the study area is selected is because it's located in one of the hilly area. The slope is above 15%. So any slope above 50% is considered to be hilly area. And the study area is one of the second uh, flood prone site due to the topographic nature of the area in Addis Ababa. And in order to identify the, the, the cause of the study area, small scale study is identified and also to uh, understand the relationship between the economic status, the flood impact and the construction material, uh, construction material of the sites also being considered when there is a substandard house, what kind of impact does it have with flooding? 
and also of course the economic status of the community also being used and when you come to the research descriptive and simulation method is used descriptive method is used to assess the flood vulnerability and there are certain indicators are used to assess for flood vulnerability components and each indicators was uh, um assessed by giving values from zero to one and this method is called weighted uh, standardized weighted sum method and zero means less vulnerable less important one is very important when it came to the simulation method uh that uh, rainfall runoff modeling is used to estimate the direct runoff amount and hung approach is used to identify this direct runoff amount because hung approach is hung approach is selected is because the study area is located in hilly area in urban areas this uh rainfall estimation or simulation method is more recommendable. So in order to uh, get the runoff days, not only the study area is considered, but since the water flow within the hydrological catchment, hydrological catchment of the study area is considered. So uh, four years is used to identify the runoff days, which is 2005, 2011, 2017, and 2020. The reason 2005, 2011 is selected is where a disabled cadastral map is registered. 2017 is where the flood really occurred in the site, most damage occurred during this time. And 2020 is selected is because it's the Europe where the study is conducted. So different type of data sources used, primary data and secondary data. Primary data more focused on within the community and also community leaders and different governmental uh, structure level office. A different kind of in-depth interview observation questionnaire is used to get the data. And secondary data is used to do the simulation and the mapping of the area, like rainfall data, so in type topography, assessments, uh, morphological data, identification of flood exposed sites. And social economic study uh, study area is based on is used based on the secondary data source. So when you see the map of the study area location, you can clearly see that it's located in the upper catchment of in the upper part of or the northern part of Addis Ababa, as the foothill of foothill of Ndoto Mountain, and the catchment covers around six point eight hectare. And the case study area is uh, 1.3 hectare. And within the case study area, there are around 88,000 units. And most of them are focused on small scale home based waivers. So, based on the simulation results, uh, we uh, I found that uh, four reasons trigger hillside flooding. The first one is increasing impervious surface area. The second one is increasing rainfall amount. The third one is slope. And uh, the last is uh, land is land cover change. So by seeing the different tier effect in 2005, the effect of slope is the second influencing factor that generate high runoff next to land is land cover. When it came to 2011, the combination of both land is land cover change and the slope effect of the slope effect create high runoff generation process, but the change of the vegetation cover from bare land to the scrub land is clearly be able to decrease the amount of amount generating in 2011. So the type of vegetation cover plays a good or a huge role to decrease the amount of amount in hilly area, especially the type of vegetation uh, that's planted in the sites. And when it came to 2017, both the combination of the land is cover, land, is land cover change and the slope has effect on the runoff generation process, but the change of land land cover was significant. So it clearly create high runoff amount to be uh, respond or generated because the runoff, the built up area it, from when compared with 2005, it increased almost within 30 percent and it clearly had an impact on the runoff response to be increased within almost like 20 percent. So the impervious uh, surface has great impact on increasing the runoff amount in the area because of it has less time to percolate or infiltrate in the ground. When it came to 2020, uh, like both the combination of the slopes, the change of land, land covers the plant type and the amount of precipitation also has a reason to increase the runoff response, but significantly the increasing of precipitation has a great impact on increasing the runoff amount because all of the data are more or less similar, especially if you see the impervious, the land land cover change, 
which related to the impervious surface, the change between 2017 and 2020 was like 0.52%, but the amount of precipitation received in 2020 was 101 millimeter, and the amount of runoff increased by 35.8%. So especially when you are seeing in a hilly area, increasing interface surface, increasing uh, rainfall intensity or the precipitation amount generates high flood peak due to short time of concentration. So after analyzing the biophysical factor, uh, buildings that are exposed to his site flooding was identified. So when we see in the catchment area, most of the buildings are highlighted as a red color, are highly exposed to hillside flooding. But when it came to the specifically our study area, they are more or less or mediumly exposed to hillside flooding. So uh, buildings or residents can be exposed to hillside flooding, but their coping mechanism makes them either more vulnerable or less vulnerable to hillside flooding. So in order to assess this uh, vulnerability, each household were assessed by uh, separately with four different uh, components, social, economical, physical, and environmental vulnerability. And later on, uh, summed and waited together to identify their flood vulnerability response. So the first one is the social vulnerability. When you see the social vulnerability, the community are considered to be less vulnerable because as I said before, there are, there are waivers who basically came in a uh, live in, in the upper parts based on their kinship so they try to support each other during the time of crisis with non-coastal way so their social vulnerability is not that much high it's very low this is one of the findings the another uh, vulnerability assessment results is indicate that the economical vulnerability and the area is considered to be highly vulnerable economically vulnerable and because uh, during the ethiopian rainy season both the weather effect and the flood effect clearly disrupt, disrupt or disrupt the co the community, their working environment because there are weavers and the person who collects woods from the forest uh, forest in the nearby area. So their source of income, the employment status, the average income, the expenditure and saving, uh, their saving uh, experience is calculated. Mm -hmm. When it came to the second. Uh, Topic is focused on ecosystem-based flood mitigation strategy and livelihood improvement for human settlements on hilly area of Addis Ababa. It's a continuation of the first research. And based on the identification of uh, flood vulnerability, factor, trig uh, factor triggering hillside flooding, uh, it indicates that most of the community are vulnerable to hillside flooding due to their economical situation, they used most of them then coastal uh, flood mitigation strategy to compact the flood impact. And their, the way they construct the houses also had uh, clearly an impact on being to be vulnerable to flood. So flood mitigation stru uh, strategy can be categorized into two structural and non-structural flood measures. Structural flood measure mostly con focus on uh, construction of um, flood mitigation strategy and the non-structural flood measures considered to be source control and eco-friendly. Combination of both are recommendable to use a flood mitigation strategy. And this unplanned development in unmanaged development in hilly area makes the community to be exposed and vulnerable to his side flooding. And uh, when we see the Addis Ababa flood management policy, mostly they focus on afforestation or river buffering in northern part and uh, construction of retaining wall as the lower part of Addis Ababa. But the gap that I identified is most of the government strategy focuses on, fo most of the government strategy focuses on uh, this avoiding the community to be part of the solution makers. So it's mostly arguing that community, to, community should be part of a solution maker to, uh, to, to create sustainable flood mitigation strategy. So uh, it will, the main objective of the study area is to develop ecosystem-based flood mitigation strategy and also to improve the livelihood of the residents because economy also one of the factors that the residents to be exposed to hillside flooding and makes them more vulnerable. And different kind of ecosystem planning and design option 
uh, with a nature based solution is uh, done during this research. So the significance of that study is to provide multifunctional benefit of ecosystem based approach, indicate how source control method in his area helps to reduce downstream flood impact, and also to indicate the policymakers to develop his side development guideline because. In Ethiopia, neither in Addis Ababa nor in Ethiopia, we don't have a hillside development guideline, but we really need, really need one because most of the recent housing expansion is going to in that direction. So it's known that uh, flood cannot be controlled, but it can be minimized. So different kind of strategy we can use to mitigate this kind of impact by using ecosystem-based flood mitigation strategy uh, applying in the hydrological catchment of the area. So when it came to the solution, uh, we have two strategies. The first one focus on giving a properly designed for waterway conveyance system. So that's the natural waterway to have a space to flow. This was identified during the analysis part. And the second strategy more focused on to integrate community with a flood mitigation strategy, how they can earn uh, money out of by protecting the environment. So these are the hydrological catchment of the study area and different kind of uh, nature-based solutions are uh, integrated in this. So by phase by phase, uh, the first one was a cross-level flood mitigation strategy. This is like considered to be um, minimize the amount of runoff at the source level, which means like as much as they can, the community to harvest rainwater from the roof. Uh, to change their uh, compound pavement uh, system from 100% impervious to make it more permeable pavements, uh, and also to keep the natural waterway uh, space where uh, it can flow away from the buildings. So while they construct the house, they should tilt the, the land to water to flow away from the structure. So that's the structure not to be affected by the flood or the rain hill effect. So the second uh, focuses on semi-public and public space um, design solutions. So like as you can see in the map, more focus on like to reduce the flow rate of uh, stormwater and to, to decrease amount of runoff by increasing on-site infiltration capacity. So most of the roads or the routes or the paths of the community, since it is steep slope, they use either stairs or lifted as it is. So to change 100% impervious surfaces to be more permeable pavements, stairways, and for those uh, paths who doesn't have who doesn't have like a long uh, length slope to be break down into be like stairs and different kind of grass can be planted here in order to decrease the runoff rate and also increase the infiltration capacity of the area by planting long rooted grass. Uh, and also different kind of like passes like this, the natural waterway streamline should be cheap as it is, and the rest of the pavement can be paved with a permanent pavement. So different kind of nature-based solution can be integrated to reduce the flow rate of the runoff in the area and increase infiltration capacity. So the third intervention more focused on the landscape improvement. So most of the urbanization, or the illegal settlements or squatting settlements is happening in unused in open space area. So changing this unused space area to more uh, productive space can help this uh, squatting to be decreased so that the community can also be integrated in this part. So different since in order to decrease the slope ranges, terracing is recommendable. Uh, to slow down or to break down the slope ranges and in the upper part they can produce food. And also, um, staggered contour is uh, applied here in order the uh, the flood to be uh, stored and infiltrated into the ground, and later on to increase soil moisture. So, like converting this unused space for a more productive area in the community to make them to grow vegetable can help them to earn more money, and they can also protect the environment out of it. So the second landscape design uh, focus improvement is focused on converting this un the another unused space area to be more recreational area, which is like uh, make um, makes them to to use this space to be working environment or like drinking coffee 
or any kind of recreational area can be implemented here so that since they are working there, they don't want any kind of uh, impervious or unplanned development to happen here. So indirectly, the community to protect the environment by engaging them doing uh, nature protective activity by uh, allocating them. The third uh, landscape design focus on uh, river rehabilitation or stream stabilization. So try to buffer the rivers, uh, installing shakedowns can help like reduce the soil erosion of the area. This helps the aesthetical value of the sites and also decrease the soil erosion and also increase infiltration capacity of the sites. So after doing the before and after simulation results, it indicates that after applying for system-based flood mitigation strategy, the runoff amount it was able to be decreased with um 22% and about like uh, 17 17.5 percent it was able to increase the groundwater recharge capacity so as much as we can in the hilly side of area we should um, protect any kind of development not to happen in the natural water flow or water thinking spots because those are the area more vulnerable and as much as we can we should avoid any kind of 100 percent impervious area to be built up in that location and from the conclusion, uh, the government should uh, integrate the community to be part of the flood uh, mitigation strategy. And based on what they do, the community should be paid with protecting the environment, which means allocating this unused space area so that they can generate economic and activity without harming the environment. And depending on the slope, depending on the land character of the place, different kind of ecosystem based planning and design options can be integrated in uh, in order to minimize the flood impact mm -hmm. and also in order to 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 minimize the urbanization effect in this special area uh government and community should work together to protect this environment and also the policymakers also should uh, come up with different kind of strategy how to compact urbanization in especially in hilly area. So when we like thinking of like flood mitigation strategy, we should always think of like source control or source level controlling method is the best approach. And also not only uh not only on the source, but also the catchment should be considered to mitigate the flood impact. Different kind of eco-friendly flood mitigation strategy can be used to protect the environment. So there should be uh, uh, hillside regulations should be um, properly designed so that the, to decrease the flood impact on site and also in the downstream of the city. Thank you. Uh, how can you increase or participate in participation in such uh, so yeah. why, why is there not enough private funds? Because uh, how long the government keeps yeah. supporting? So what exactly is should be? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think the uh, the that's why this this uh, this this identified this what the private funding should be. Most of the private sector, the last two Why private sector are not the main? Why is it always need a government sector? So, how to find it? But how it is especially the risk for the private sector? It is basically the market because private sector always think about money. So, if they think about this uh, risk in the market and private sector, the other risk, then they will not be basically coming into the interface. So I think from the government side, uh, what needs to be done is really to minimize those risks so that people in the private sector can come into pizza so that the government can create a kind of enabling environment for the private sector. But if there is a good model, why is it not if the private sector perceives that something is going to be beneficial or better in the money of public, why don't they not do it? I mean, I'm sure the models. Uh, what are created, they are not uh, uh, 
able to carry so I am not able to convince the investors. Is it just that? Yeah, I think it's what the book is. Uh, they have to invest the money in the sector. So they think so the policy is the risk is too high. Yes. 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 So uh, there are risks which cannot be decreased. So it's definitely this, but uh, there's going to be some pain because the way they are expected to follow, they can allow the same decision. There's not only one kind of this kind of solution, but the types of also. So I think we need to look into the whole supply of the same issue here. I think from the government service of motivating to private centers, so I think it's kind of a continuous process. If we almost there are different models and uh, sources are there, still private centers are not coming there. So I think we need to think from the risk deposit to try to minimize those sources. Thank you. What uh, we have this part or what do you think is important to convert agro-based to biogas? What is more important? You are talking about agro waste to biogas. Yeah. Which route you are going to? So we are going to this uh, elevator. Just this the last question yeah, because it's... we need to also move to the next. Sure. sure. No, so last question. Dr. Liam, uh, then Ishita, I have one question. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Ishita, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm there. I'm there. Ishita, what? Uh, your diction is very good. Uh, I have, uh, so that is very good. But one thing you said that bio leaching is under chemi chemical methods. Okay. Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, under chemical, yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. Under chemical methods, you showed bio leaching. Okay, yes, but leaching is not, does not classify under uh, chemical methods. Bio leaching uh, is under biological methods. Okay, 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 ma'am. Right. Put the heading is biochemical right. methods. Yes. That would All have right. Okay, so okay ma'am. What you could have included. So okay, uh, that is the only thing I wish to say. And, All right, ma'am. And uh, Bentham, you have done a lot of work on plant mitigation in Ethiopia. Ben Bentham, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, it would have been very nice to hear you out uh, for longer periods of time. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't have sufficient time. So you had to conclude your presentations early. Uh, but uh, I guess you have done a lot of work. Uh, and uh, you are a PhD student? I am a master's student. I graduated. Master's students and uh, okay. So, uh, have you published? Uh, yes, I did not publish internationally, but uh, I did my this is my master's thesis. Okay, this is your master's thesis. You have done a very good amount of work. And congratulations. Okay, thank 